Well, I'm so excited to be here to celebrate this really special event. I thought I would talk a little bit about how nature makes materials. I brought along with me an abalone shell. This abalone shell is a biocomposite material that's 98% by mass calcium carbonate and 2% by mass um, protein. Yet it's 3,000 times tougher than its geological counterpart. And a lot of people might use um, structures like abalone shells, like chalk. I've been fascinated by how nature makes materials, and there's a lot of secrets to how they do such an exquisite job. Part of it is that these materials are, are macroscopic in structure, but they're formed at the nanoscale. They're formed at the nanoscale, and they use proteins that are coded by the genetic level that allow them to build these really exquisite structures. So something I think is very fascinating is, what if you could give life to non-living structures, like batteries and like solar cells? What if they had some of the same capabilities that an abalone shell did in terms of being able to build really exquisite structures at room temperature and room pressure using non-toxic chemicals and adding no toxic materials back into the environment? So that's kind of the vision that, that, um, that I've been thinking about. And so what if you could grow a battery in a Petri dish? Or what if you could give genetic information to a battery so that it could actually become better as a function of time and do so in an environmentally friendly way? And so going back to this abalone shell, one thing besides being nanostructured, one thing that's fascinating is when a male and female abalone get together, they pass on the genetic information that says, this is how to build an exquisite uh, material. Here's how to do it at room temperature and pressure using non-toxic materials. Same with diatoms, which are shown right here, which are glassiest structures. Every time the diatoms replicate, they give the genetic information that says, here's how to build glass in the ocean that's perfectly nanostructured, and you can do it the same over and over again. So what if you could do the same thing with a solar cell or a battery? And so um, I like to say my favorite biomaterial is my four-year-old. Um, but anyone who's, who's ever had or knows small children know they're incredibly complex organisms. And so <laughs> if, if you wanted to convince them to do something that they don't want to do, it's very difficult. And so when we think about future technologies, we actually think of um, using bacteria and virus, sim simple organisms. Can you convince them to work with a new toolbox so that they can build a structure that would be um, important to me? Also, when we think about future technologies, we start with the beginning of, of Earth. Basically, it took a billion years to have, have life um, on Earth, and very rapidly they became multicellular, they could replicate, they could use photosynthesis as a way of getting their, their energy source, but it wasn't until about 500 million years ago during the Cambrian geologic time period that organisms in the ocean started making hard materials. Before that, they were all soft, uh, fluffy structures, and it was during this time that there was increased calcium and, and iron and silicon in the environment, and organisms learned how to make hard materials. And so that's what I would like to be able to do, convince biology to work with uh, the rest of the periodic table. Now, if you look at, at biology, um, there's many structures like DNA and antibodies and proteins and, and ribosomes that you've heard about that are already nanostructured. So nature already gives us really exquisite structures on the nanoscale. What if we could harness them and, and convince them to not, not you know, be an antibody that, that does something like HIV, which was an incredibly interesting talk earlier, but what if we could convince them to build a solar cell for us? And so here's some examples of some natural shells, natural biological materials, the abalone shell here. And if you fracture it, you can look at it, the fact that it's nanostructured. There's diatoms made out of uh, SiO2. And there are magnetotactic bacteria that make small single domain magnets used for navigation. So all, what, what all these have in common is these materials are structured at the nanoscale, and they have a DNA sequence that codes for a protein sequence that gives them the blueprint to be able to build these really wonderful structures. Now, going back to the abalone shell, the abalone shell, um, the abalone makes this shell by having these proteins. These proteins are very negatively, in, negatively charged, and it can pull calcium out of the environment, put down a layer of calcium and then carbonate, calcium and carbonate. It has the chemical sequences of the amino acids, which says this is how to build the structure. Here's the DNA sequence, here's the protein sequence in order to do it. And so an interesting idea is, what if you could take any material that you wanted or any element on the periodic table and find its corresponding DNA DNA sequence that coded for a corresponding protein sequence to build a structure, but not build an abalone shell, build something that through um, nature has ha never had the opportunity to work with yet. And so here's uh, the, the periodic table. I'm, I absolutely love the periodic table. Every year for the incoming uh, freshman class at MIT, I have a periodic table made that says, welcome to MIT, now you're in your element. Um, <laughs> And uh, you flip it over, and it's the amino acids with the, with the pH at which they have different charges. And so 
to, to I, I give this out to, to thousands of people, and I know it says MIT, and this is Caltech, but I have a couple extra if, if people want it. Um, <laughs> And um, I was really fortunate to have um, President Obama visit my lab uh, this year and his visit to, to MIT, and I really wanted to give him a periodic table. So I stayed up at night and I talked to my husband, how do I you know, give President Obama a periodic table? What if he says, oh, I already have one or I've already memorized it? <laughs> and so um, he came to visit my lab and, and, and looked around. It was a great visit. And then afterwards I said, sir, I want to give you the periodic table uh, in case you're ever in a bind and need to calculate molecular weight. And um, I thought molecular weight sounded much less nerdy than, than molar mass. And, um, <laughs> and so he looked at it, and he said, um, uh, thank you, I'll look at it periodically. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> later in a, um, a, a lecture that he gave on clean energy, he pulled it out and said, look, people in MIT, they give out periodic tables. So. So basically, um, what I didn't tell you is that uh, it was about 500 million years ago that organisms started making materials, but it took them about 50 million years to get good at it. It took them about 50 million years to learn how to perfect how to make that abalone shell, and that's, that's a hard sell to a graduate student. I have this great project, <laughs> 50 million years, and so we had to develop a way of, of trying to do this more rapidly. And we, so we use a, a, a virus that's a non-toxic virus called M13 bacteriophage that's job is to infect bacteria. Well, it has a simple DNA structure that you can go in and, and cut and paste uh, additional DNA um, sequences into it. And by doing that, it allows the, the virus to express random protein sequences. And this is pretty easy biotechnology, and you can basically do this a billion times. And so you can go in and have a billion different viruses that are all genetically identical, but they differ from each other based on their, their tips, on one sequence um, that codes for one protein. Now, if you take all billion viruses and you can put them in one drop of, of liquid, you can force them to interact with anything you want on the periodic table, and through a process of selection evolution, you can pull one out of a billion that does something that you'd like it to do, like grow a battery or grow a solar cell. And so basically, viruses can't replicate themselves. They need a host. Once you find that one out of a billion, you infect it into a bacteria, and you make um, billions and, and, and millions and billions of, of copies of that particular sequence. And so the other thing that's beautiful about biology is that biology gives you really exquisite um, structures, nice link scales. And these viruses are long and skinny, and they um, um, we can get them to express the ability to grow something like semiconductors um, or uh, materials for batteries. Now, this is a high-powered battery that we grew in my lab. We engineered viruses to pick up carbon nanotubes, which you heard about earlier. So on one, one part of the virus grabs a carbon nanotube. The other part of the virus has a sequence that can grow an electrode material for a battery. And then it wires itself to the current collector. And so through a process of selection evolution, we went from being able to have a virus that made kind of a crummy battery to a virus that made a good battery to a virus that made a record-breaking um, high-powered battery that's all made at room temperature, uh, basically at, at the bench top. And that battery went to the White House uh, for a press conference, and uh, I, I brought it here. You can see it in this case um, that's lighting this LED. Now, if we could scale this, um, you could actually use it to, um, to, to drive your, your, um, run your Prius, which is kind of my dream to be able to drive a, a virus-powered car. Uh, but it's basically where you would basically, you can, you can um, pull one out of a billion, you can make lots of um, amplifications to it. Basically, you make an amplification in the lab, and then you get it to self-assemble into a structure like a battery. Um, we're able to do this also with catalysis. Uh, this is the uh, example of uh, photocatalytic splitting of water. And what we've been able to do is engineer um, a virus to basically take dye-absorbing molecules and line them up on the surface of the virus so that it acts as an antenna, and you get a, a energy transfer across the virus. And then we give it a second gene to grow an inorganic material that can be used to split um, water into oxygen and hydrogen that could be used for, for clean fuels. And I brought an example with me of that today. My students promised me it would work. Uh, these are virus-assembled uh, nanowires. When you shine light on them, you can start seeing them bubbling. In this case, uh, you're seeing oxygen uh, bubbles come out. And I'll have these outside so you can, uh, you can play around with some of these demos uh, if you'd like afterwards. And um, basically, uh, by controlling the genes, you can control multiple materials to improve your device performance. The last example are carb uh, are. Um, our solar cells, you can also do this with solar cells. We've been able to engineer viruses to pick up uh, carbon nanotubes and then grow titanium dioxide uh, around them, basically, and, and use as a, um, a way of getting electrons through the device. And what we found is through genetic engineering, we can actually increase um, the um, 
efficiencies of these solar cells um, to, um, to record uh, numbers for these types of, uh, of dye-synthesized, uh, easily water-based solar cell kind of systems. And I brought one of those as well that, um, that you can uh, play around with outside afterwards. So this is a, a virus-based solar cell. Through evolution and selection, we, we took it from basically an, uh, an eight, um, 8 percent efficiency solar cell to 11 uh, percent efficiency solar cell. So I hope that uh, I've convinced you that, uh, that there's a lot of great, um, uh, interesting um, um, things to be learned about how nature makes materials and taking it the next step to see if you can, you can force or whether you can take advantage of how nature makes materials to make things that, that nature hasn't yet dreamed of making. Thank you.